Hello there, and a uh, big thank you for joining us today for this Bluevent webinar. Uh, so in this session, we're going to be looking at how you can utilize a CDP and analytics for your customer journey optimization. So over the next 30 minutes or so, we'll be trying to bring you away from that uh, linear campaign mindset and helping you to move to a more always on approach in your omnichannel um, strategy with, with your marketing. So just a couple of housekeeping bits before I pass you over to our presenter. So firstly, do ask us questions. Um, if you look to the right-hand side of your screen, um, you should see the drop-down box um, there, and you can submit your questions throughout the presentation, and we'll get to them at the end of the session. Uh, the second thing is, uh, is that uh, all Bright Talk sessions are recorded, and then you can view them um, in our channel. So if you go into the top top bar and type in Blue Venn, then you can find our channel and you can see this presentation and all of our past and upcoming webinars. Uh, and the last thing is that I have attached our customer journey optimization ebook to this session and you can download that for free. Uh, it's a great resource and it really goes hand in hand with this webinar. So highly recommend highly recommend downloading that now um, and I'll also remind you at the end of the session. Okay, so today we have Matt Diamond, who's one of our consultants at Bluven, who'll be presenting. So Matt, thank you so much for joining us. It's great to be here, Jen. Hello, everybody. Uh, we're actually based here in our Bristol office in the UK, uh, and we've also got other offices in the US and France. But yeah, thank you very much for joining us today, Matt. And um, if you're ready, I'll pass over to you. Brilliant. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining the webinar today. So let's not mess around and let's actually jump straight in then. I wanted to begin today by defining what we mean by a customer journey. So the customer journey is the sum of all of the touch points a customer has been through with your brand and is a term that's often applied to the process of a customer moving through the traditional buying cycle. Essentially, the customer journey tells the story of the customer's interactions with your brand. And the five parts of a journey that everyone I speak to, regardless of their sector or their role in marketing, agree on are awareness, consideration, purchase, advocacy, and loyalty. And the names that we use for each of these stages will naturally vary slightly depending on the different contexts of B2B, B2C, and B2B2C, but the aim is still the same to actually map out the engagement cycle between brand and customer. So let's have a look at each stage in a little bit more detail. So if we start with awareness, this is where customers are becoming more aware of your brand. And this can be through any number of means and any, through any number of channels. And we'll look at those means and those channels in a bit more detail in a moment. When we get to consideration, this is where customers, or if they're a first time buyer of your particular brand, your prospects, are considering your offering and making comparisons with what, you, what they perceive to be your competition. When we get to the purchasing or buying stage, this is the process of actually making the purchase and involves a lot more of a one-to-one -one level of interaction. Now, from a B2C perspective, that could easily be you know, direct contact with members of your sales team or with an operational system such as an e-commerce payment provider integrated into your checkout process of your website. And in the B2B space, this usually involves face-to-face -face meetings, product demonstrations, and other conversations that are specific to your business. It's also worth noting that some of these things, especially in the B2B space, can also take part as part of the consideration stage. And it's actually all dependent on the process that the business making the purchase is choosing to follow. If we move on to loyalty, this is where customers are demonstrating a faithfulness and commitment to your brand and its products or services. And this can be seen through repeat purchases, not shopping with competing brands, or always buying the same products from you at a regular time frame, regardless of fluctuations within the price. And finally, we come to advocacy. And this is where a customer is actively talking about your product or service in a positive way and evangelizing its benefits, as well as the experience of interacting with your brand, essentially exhibiting a form of influencer behavior. However, the relationship between loyalty and advocacy can be an interesting one. Now, I say this because 
sometimes your most loyal customers are not always advocates, and your advocates are not always particularly loyal. Matt, I have to say, I couldn't agree more with your points here. Um, and actually, we were discussing this earlier. I've got a great example of this. Go for it. Which is the perfume industry. So perfume, okay. or aftershave for you, obviously, Matt, um, <laughs> is, is a really personal purchase. Um, and it's something that you're very loyal to. So when you pick a perfume brand or a certain scent, it becomes kind of part of your identity. You know, you put it on every morning. Absolutely. You might have special perfume you put on in the evenings. Um, and so you could be really loyal to this brand, but actually you don't want to be the biggest advocate because you don't want people to smell the same as you because it's so personal. So I think that everything you're saying here really fits in with that example quite nicely. No, absolutely. And I, I think you also see the same when you're talking to, I see the same when we're talking to lots of different fashion brands, you know, whether it's that particular pair of jeans or that perfect pair of shoes, you, you kind of don't necessarily want to share it because it, it forms almost part of that unique identity that you have that defines you. Mm. But I think to come back to what we were talking about, I think you know, we need to have a look at the types of content that are actually typical for the, at this particular, at all of these different stages. So many of the conversations I've had about optimizing the customer journey have centered around optimizing the journey as a linear process. I get asked questions such as, well, how do we become more targeted with our content? How do we reduce spending on a particular channel or on a particular strategy but see an increase in ROI? But I just want to sort of take a step back here and say, okay, are we falling into the trap of trying to do the right things at what we as marketers perceive to be the right time? If we take the example that we see on the screen here, is optimizing this linear process the right way to be optimizing our customer's journey? Are we approaching our actual journey from a product-centric or customer-centric viewpoint? And concurrently, are we effectively using what we know about our customers' interactions with our brand to enhance and optimize their experience? And these are all questions that need, to be an that need to be answered if we're looking to provide for the journey of the modern, highly informed customer. So if we actually revisit our customer journey, is it really as linear as we've traditionally thought? Or are our customers actually becoming a lot more agile in the way that they approach engagements with our brand? So no matter the stages of a customer journey, Customers move through each of these stages at their own pace, dictating the time they spend at each point. We're all trying to use data in one form or another, whether that's first-party data, third-party data, or even second-party data, as an informer for optimizing each of these different touch points or stages. But data and the historical view are not enough. We as marketers need to be cognizant of the future possibilities as well as being aware of what has occurred in the past. Now at this point, I actually wanted to share an experience that I've had with a brand I encountered a few years ago and talk about the customer journey that I went on with this particular brand. Now, to start with, I actually came across the brand in question through a family friend. And as part of that conversation, I, I really empath you know, empathized with what this brand stood for and the ethos that they had behind this particular brand. And just because of that, I immediately started talking to others about the brand, you know, due to really engaging with that story and the mission that they had behind the production of their actual products. And at the same time, I also began to, admittedly very passively, engage with the social media feeds of a couple of their different brand ambassadors. I just want to take a pause here as well and just point out that I've made no purchase at this point. I've not even consciously considered making a purchase. I just really, really liked the story and the way it was told. Now, I moved for on from the advocacy stage quite quickly because I actually went to an event and I came across a little pop-up shop that this particular brand had. And 
I actually made a small, what a lot of people would consider a, a very sort of low risk purchase because I'd actually left something at home. So I just bought something to replace what I had forgotten to bring with me. And I started to use that straight away at the event. But once home, I then started to actually evaluate what I bought from, an, from a sort of a slightly more ownership orientated perspective and looked at how it would fit within my actual lifestyle. So once I've continued to actually use this particular product, I've still continued to advocate for the brand, started to show this particular product to friends and talk to them about how interesting I found it and how easy it was to use. But I also then still continued that passive level of engagement on social media. And it's through that engagement I saw that the brands were actually expanding and opening a store near to me. So I signed up to the newsletter on the website. And it's worth pointing out, this is actually the first time I'd ever been on this particular brand's website. And a few weeks later, again, talking to that same family friend, I ended up actually getting an invite to a sample sale that they had hosted at their particular headquarters. And when the time came, I actually went to the particular sample sale. I purchased a few products. And at this point, I'm still nowhere near a profitable or valuable customer. I've never purchased a full price item. And I met some of the staff that were there as well, and I was really impressed with the way they embodied the actual brand ethos. And again, I went back to that consideration phase. I went home, I used the products, and I continued that advocacy even further. And I essentially became the micro-influencer for that brand, despite not being profitable to them, right across my little group of friends. Now, a few weeks after, having signed up for the store opening, I actually, I actually was able to attend, thankfully, and I met the team there, and I experienced that exact same level of authenticity. And it was this experience that was the tipping point for me that led to me becoming a loyal customer. And right across this story, and one thing I, I never really realized until I was actually reviewing my own engagement habits in preparation for this webinar today, is how I actually never follow the linear journey we spoke about earlier. And that realization is what made me think about how the marketers for the brands that I interact with and purchase from are actually no longer in charge of how I experience the brand. As a customer, I actually go where I want to go and I experience the brand on my terms and not on the brand. And I'm sure that I'm not the only one who has, who has this way of approaching purchasing and the customer journey. Now with social media and the advancement of technology, the space for interaction between brands and customers and prospects has changed. Customers can therefore create their own spaces and places, their own content, and they can openly discuss that content in a public forum that marketers don't necessarily control something I'll come back to in a moment. TripAdvisor is a really, really good example of this. You can see a, a, a review for somewhere, a particular holiday or a particular Airbnb, for example, and you can choose not to book that just based upon those reviews. And this led me to conclude that all of the posts, the reviews, the videos, the blogs, photos, comments, Everything, every piece of content that includes your brand or your product is marketing that you as a marketer have absolutely no direct control over. And it's also worth bearing in mind that on their journey and at any point, any customer can be an advisor, a buyer, a reseller. They can be a recommender. They could, at one stage, they were a prospect. They could become a loyalist, a detractor, or even be an arch enemy of the brand. It's these journeys that I believe we should think about optimizing, as well as the traditional process-driven journeys, such as the path to purchase that we have been looking at as an example today. And it's the power of the consumer in the modern age that demands our respect, and it's demanding how we as brands change how we engage with our customers. And the first part of respecting that power is to identify the interaction points between your brand and the consumer, and subsequently identifying the different levels of control that you have over each of those points. 
Now, in my experience, talking to our clients, there are four types of control a marketer may have over an interaction point. And again, like the definitions of the journey stages we were speaking about earlier, you may have different names, but to ensure we're all on the same page, I wanted to just take you through how I look at them. So if we start at the top here with a controller, and just imagine that we're at a party. So if you're, the if you're in control and you are the controller, this is where you as a marketer, you own the party. You create the experience. You define the location for that experience. You decide who's on the guest list and also what they can do while they're actually at the party. Some examples of that would be things such as newsletters or direct mail or email, for example, with explicit offers within them. And as we move down through this particular hierarchy, we get to the participant stage where, as a marketer, you're, you're invited to the party. You can join in, you can socialize, and you can meet people. But you can't exercise the level of control that you had as a controller. You can't really have that level of control over what happens that you had. And this covers most of the social media platforms in principle, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, for example. If you were an observer, this is where you're actually not invited to the party at all, but you're, you're looking through the window, so to speak. You have no control over what you're seeing, but you can still actually view it. Think about YouTube, blogs and reviews, TripAdvisor, as I mentioned earlier. And if you get to the point where you're actually uninvolved, just like with my particular um, anecdote earlier, this is, the, this is the kind of private conversations that happen between friends, family, business colleagues, or even internal discussions within a business where, then, where that business is evaluating your particular product offering. So where we get to here is we're not just talking about data and interaction platforms and optimize, optimization of a, a linear process. It's about people and their experiences, their beliefs and their different points of view. So I think it's fair to say that this isn't just about making a purchase, but it's about the experience of making the purchase itself. And the brand I spoke about earlier are particularly good at doing this. Now, in their, their particular store that they opened down the road from where I live, they actually have a coffee shop. And they will always take the time to you know, make you a coffee, share a coffee with you, and actually chat about your most recent trips or maybe pop a particular surf movie on, for example, or take you through some of the clips that the latest ambassadors have shared on their particular uh, social feeds, for example. And it's the experience itself that's often, often the differentiating factor in the purchase, whether that's through an online channel, such as through the website. Is it easy to check out? Is it easy to find what you're looking for? Are the sizes in stock? Or whether it's offline as well, in the, that more sort of face-to-face -face interaction, whether it's B2C, B2B, or B2B2C. And this is especially true if you're in the business of selling experiences. I was talking to a couple of different people and we came back, we came back to the idea here of holidays. You know, you're never going to go into a travel agent and actually book a holiday, or even online as well, with a company whose sales rep or whose website has been presumptuous and hasn't given you what you need to have the faith that they can provide the experience that you are looking to have while you take your break. So optimizing the customer journey then. It's not just about understanding the touch points we have with our customers, but also about understanding the level of control that we have over those touch points, as well as being aware of the non-linearity of the modern customer's journey. To that extent, brands and us as marketers, we need to actually understand and optimize how we engage with customers through the channels that we have in blue here on the screen, the above the line channels, where we actually have little or no control. An example of this is actually something that I came across in my personal life, and it is a YouTuber and a blogger who I came across about a year ago, who is called Mr. JWW. Now, he started out as essentially, this is self-confessed as well, as just a guy who loved cars. He was fortunate enough to have purchased a car that he wanted to share with, with his friends. And he made a few videos of the road trips that him and a couple of other friends went on around the UK, just in between their sort of day-to-day -day lives. 
Now, as I said, he started out just as a guy who loved cars. And his channel has grown so much in the last 18 months, he's now actually taken a back seat from his other business interests and has taken up working on YouTube full time. And he's also, off the back of this, been presenting content and events for brands such as McLaren, Aston Martin. And he also launched a new Mercedes hypercar alongside Lewis Hamilton. While he has only a relatively small fan base compared to the traditionally thought of large influencers on YouTube, and my last time I checked, it was 64 million views and about 395,000 subscribers. This is also tallying with a shift that I've been noticing in this sort of above the line influencer space. And in the case of Mr. JWW, this has actually led to him actually getting more work because he is actually measuring himself based upon the level of engagement he has from his particular followers and his subscribers rather than just his overall reach. And it's led to him actually becoming a brand ambassador for Michelin, as well as doing more television work and also doing increasing amounts of paid collaborative content for different global brands such as Emirates Airways. So overall then, to ensure that we're actually optimizing the customer journey and utilizing all of the first party data that we spend all of these different all of the hours collecting, cleansing, matching, merging, deduplicating, visualizing, exploring, and utilizing in many different ways across our different day-to-day -day activities, we have a couple of things that we need to do. Firstly, we actually need to combine all of that data and attain a golden record for each customer by consolidating all of that first-party data into a single place. And that's customer data platform to be specific. But as well as having all of that data in one place and being able to get to it and to be able to view it and analyze it, we also need to be aware of a number of other things as well. This is things such as being aware of the actual journey that our customer is on. To go back to the car analogy, are they taking a direct route down the motorway or the freeway? Or are they taking the scenic cross-country route? Or are they forging their own path and completely ignoring the roads altogether? As well as that, we need to be recognizing that the journey is non-linear, that it's not an A, B, C, D tick box process. And as part of that, we need to acknowledge the actual touch points and identify the touch points that we have between the business and the customer or the prospect and understand the level of control that we have over those touch points. And at the same time, explore new ways to be present where we don't actually have complete control from a marketing perspective and provide for the experiential nature of the customer journey, not just the transaction. Most of all, to do this in a way that provides the most relevant content through the most appropriate channels to all of our customers, no matter what stage they may be at in their customer journey. Awesome, thanks Matt. Okay, we're gonna go on to the Q&A section of the webinar now. We have had some some questions through and also some thoughts, which is really good. Um, so if you have any um, any ideas or questions, keep sending them through to us and uh, and we'll get to them at the end. So actually, Chris made a really good point um, at the start when we were talking about uh, loyalty and advocacy and the issues surrounding that. Um, and he, he just wanted to highlight that, you know, we have the same difficulty in the B2B space. Obviously, if you find a great solution for your company, sometimes you, you don't want to um, you know, boast about it because you know you may not want to share your your secrets. So um, that's a really good point from Chris. Um, obviously, we're in the B two B space, so I can uh, take down so where you're coming from there, Chris. <laughs> uh, being in the marketing department myself. Um, so yeah, the, one of the first questions I wanted to ask you, Matt, was that obviously this we've talked a lot about um, the theory in this. So putting that theory into practice, can you recommend um, some different customer journeys? Um, for our audience today, so just some some different examples. Okay. So the journey, or I think, to be really honest, the journey or the journeys your customers are on tends to be very specific to each individual brand. Mm -hmm. The channels that you use, the channel mix you have, the different types of content you see success with, and also the products you sell and the type of buyers that you have as well. Many of the brands that I've actually worked with have begun this process of moving from these, these more sort of waterfall campaigns to customer journeys. 
And they've begun this by mapping out their existing touch points that they have with their customers and listing out what channels those touch points are on, the specific content that's used. And actually understanding, as I said, the level of control they have over the content in that particular channel. And it's also worth pointing out as well that defining and actually deploying and optimizing customer journeys isn't something that you can just do as a, a quick exercise. It's something that you're always going to be coming back to. It's an iterative process of ongoing improvement, which usually starts with existing campaigns and touch points as a basis. Most of the customers I've worked with actually start this process by, that sounds silly, getting a huge piece of paper, rolling it out on the floor and actually mapping out their customer journey. Mm. And then beginning at the beginning, they start with the welcome campaign, where they iterate the experience they're providing for their customers. Because it's a lot easier for us as humans to work with if we start at the beginning with that particular welcome journey as well. Brilliant, okay. And we have actually just had a question through that is asking, how do you make sure that the creative comes at the right time with the right message to the audience uh, that you pull from the CDP? Which is kind of a bit what we were just talking about then. It's not, it, it's a long process, isn't it? It's not something that you can Absolutely. Um, run with straight away. And I think that um, it starts, you start from the beginning and then you gradually build up those different experiences. And I think when we talk about to look at the question as well is, is when we talk about the right time part of that is down to the marketer actually bringing their own empirical knowledge of their data and their customers as well mm. it's not just something a customer data platform can help you make the right decisions but it's about giving that data platform the right information but also actually as like I said using that empirical knowledge underpinned by the data to define what that right time is and that's where tools such as Blue Venn can actually help you to build the specific business rules that you require to actually deploy the content that you're looking to send out at the right time in the customer journey as well. That's great. So I guess it's not actually always, the power isn't always in the hands of the marketers because that's why you have these solutions because it kind of makes the decision for you, right? Absolutely. You can, you can, have, it, you can have it set either way depending upon how you want to use it. Okay, and the next one uh, was, how can we enhance the customer journey if we don't know who the customer is? So I assume because they haven't made a purchase with us yet. Okay. So I think just to just sort of look at this, this is, I would say this is more of a question about optimizing the journey from the unknown customer. Mm. And that's actually a lot, you know, so it's a lot about actually optimizing the handover point between being an unknown customer and, and the kind of personalization and the kind of optimizations that we can do when someone is unknown before they actually choose to identify by making a purchase or by signing up to a newsletter and sharing that PII or personally identifiable information with us. And actually what we can do to smooth that handover and use what we've learned when the customer has been unknown to inform how we actually engage people when they become known. And we have a tool here at Blue Venn, Blue Relevance, which we've not covered today, which is actually able to really help with this. And it's not only helping to actually build up an understanding of each of those unknown customers or browsers and optimize the experience of them based upon what we know about them at that point. But once they become known, it enables all of that data that was gathered when they were an unknown, so to speak. And we can actually then use that to actually optimize, personalize, and further coordinate the journey that's going to actually aid us in delivering the type of experience our customers demand. So we have also had a really great question through. Matt, you wouldn't have had a chance to read this because you've been talking, but I'll quickly go through it. So this person said, thanks for the presentation, Matt. It's really interesting and well delivered. Um, my question is, you've talked about the importance of brands mapping out the touch points with their customers, as well as understanding where in the journey a customer is. But a challenge that most businesses, e.g. retailers, are struggling with is matching the identity, um, the identity of a customer across online and offline touch points. How can this challenge be overcome? Which is a fantastic question, I think, because when we think of customer data platforms, we're talking about online data. We haven't really you know, gone into a lot of detail, actually, about the offline stuff. So how do we bring all of this together? So when we're, when we're actually using a customer data platform, and I can absolutely, from a previous career, I can empathize with the retail example. It's something I've actually, I've, I've lived myself 
So I know <laughs> I, I completely understand how difficult mm -hmm. and how frustrating it can be. So the real thing here is about the is about the source systems you have and actually starting to be able to combine all of that data. So it could be data from a, a point of sale system, for example, with an e-commerce platform, you know, online payment gateways, for example, and bringing all of this data together and actually then being able to tie that back to an individual. And there are a number of different ways we can do that. And I think that's probably a going into the, the depth behind that is something that we can go into maybe on a future presentation or if the person that actually asked the question has left some contact details i'd be happy to actually have a, a more in-depth conversation with them but it's the ability of the customer data platform like you said to actually tie this back to a known customer and this is done through pii or personally identifiable information across all of these different channels so that you can see what the customer has done across each of these different channels and actually use that to personalize and optimize the customer journey as well. Awesome, thanks Matt. Um, and also, um, we have had quite a few questions through, so I'm sorry we might not be able to answer all of them, but we'll definitely answer them offline. Um, so the next question that I want to cover is, what are the main metrics for evaluating customer experience success? Which is a really good point because, I mean, a lot of this stuff we've said, you know, it's all about building the customer experience. Some of it, we how how do we even measure that? So, how do we know if we're if we're doing the right stuff with our customer <laughs> customer journey mapping? It's a really it's a really good point, actually. <laughs> and I think for from the from the idea of main metrics, I, I think just to just to answer that part of the question first, like journeys, the, the, it's the main metrics that are actually personal. They're really personal to each brand and the products you sell. But broadly speaking, it's, it's more down the customer satisfaction side of things. It's things like your net promoter score and all of these sort of survey-based satisfaction metrics, but also some of the traditional metrics as well, such as you know, channel specifics, so things like your conversion rates as well, are all going to play a part within that. And these are all really, really good starting points to actually have these metrics in mind. But one of the big things, as I touched upon earlier, is actually having all the data in one place. So if you're actually spending the time collecting the satisfaction metrics, they're only going to help if you can actually tie them back to the individual customer. And if you are able, if you are in that lucky position where you can actually tie those results back to the individual, it then becomes about that granularity of understanding that you have about the stage that that particular customer is at in their journey and having a complete view of all of their past interactions and purchases. And it's both of these sort of challenges that can be really quickly overcome when you actually choose to deploy a customer data platform, combine all of that data into one place, and have that complete 360 degree view, because you get that visibility, and that is what allows you to then further optimize the journey. Awesome, thanks Matt. And then this is the last one I'm gonna cover, but just to reiterate what you've just said, so this question was, uh, what is the most effective way to ingest dis disconnected, sensitive, and dirty customer data from all the different data sources into one simple dynamic customer profile? So sorry to make, us, make you repeat yourself. That's fine. But I just want to make sure we answer them. So the simple way to do this is actually through the deployment of a customer data platform. And the role of a customer data platform, just to be very clear, is to connect to all of your different source systems or what we call operational systems. And it's, you know, just to give a few examples, as I said earlier, it could be your point of sale system, it could be your CRM, it could be your call center system, it could be your e-commerce website. It could even be you know, other sort of survey-based interaction systems as well. Anywhere that you're gathering customer data to be used within a particular channel. And the next step of it is not just to have that data existing in each of those channels, but to actually combine that into a customer data platform. Mm. And it's that customer data platform that will then go through all of the matching, merging, deduplicating processes that will link all of that data back together up to an individual customer so that you are able to you know, obtain that golden record that is underpinning all of your marketing activities. And it's that golden record that the single customer view is actually providing the access to. 
Does that, does that answer your question there? Yeah, it does. Thank you so much, Matt. Okay, we have had loads more questions through, but what we'll have to do is just answer them offline. So I'm really sorry if we didn't cover your question, but we'll email you later today, so keep an eye out uh, for that. We'll contact you via email. Um, so just to, sum, just, just to summarise now, thank you so much for joining this session. Um, obviously, we could talk about this subject for days and days. There's so much to say, isn't there, Matt? But, Absolutely. Um, Hopefully we've answered some of your questions that you may have had. Um, if you've got some outstanding questions, please feel free to email us. You can email us at marketing at bluevend.com uh, and we'll get back to you. Also, if you head to the website, www.bluevend.com, we've got tons of great resources on CDPs, SCVs, um, customer journeys, um, everything everything you can imagine to do with customer analytics and customer based platforms. Um, we've also got an upcoming um, demonstration of our CDP platform. Um, I think it's next week. So if you head to our website, you can actually register for it there. So you can see everything we've been talking about, but actually in action and see, it, see how the platform does it uh, for yourselves. Um, also, I did mention at the beginning that I have attached our customer journey optimization ebook to the webinar. Um, so uh, if you haven't already, I would just quickly download that. Um, if you don't manage to get the chance, you can always head to our website and it's under the resources tab there. Um, and then probably the last thing to say is, um, if you want to find out how other companies um, have been utilizing customer journey optimization strategies, um, then head to our site and then if you click under the clients tab, we've got loads of, of great case studies there. We've got companies like The White Company, um, Subaru, um, LastMinute.com and many, many more. Uh, and you can really see how these guys uh, are putting into action all the theory that we've discussed today. Um, so, yep, that's it from me and Matt. Thank you so much for joining, and uh, we'll hopefully be speaking with you soon. Uh, have a lovely day. Goodbye.